Over the last 50 years, many cities have realized that they have a problem. That problem? Suburban sprawl. As cities expanded, transporting people around them in private cars started to become harder to manage. Wide roads created far afield places to sprawl to. But then more people drove, so we widened the road. So more people drove. So we widened the road. So more people drove. So we widened the road. So more people drove. That's why you end up with a 401. The latest city building simulators are pretty much transportation simulators. It's the hardest part of the game. If national politics is the economy stupid, municipal politics is its transportation stupid. People started to think about ways to break this cycle, and densification is pretty much always at the top of the list. Densification solves this problem in a few ways. When people pay more taxes on a smaller area, you can give them great transit services like subways that allow them to ditch the car. Furthermore, a lot of the stuff they need is now within walking distance, and <laughs> often it's just downstairs. But how do we make cities densify? Well, if you ask someone in the early 2000s, they're probably going to talk about literally capping their land. This far, no further. Sometimes this was done as agricultural land reserves, sometimes a literal green belt around the city. In my country, there are now green belts around Toronto and Ottawa. More patchy agricultural land reserve flavors surround Vancouver and Montreal. These green belts remove the option to build new housing outwards, so there's no way to grow but up, right? No, a good idea had unintended consequences. There are some serious problems that mean that these green belts didn't really go to municipal plan. In fact, I think that green belts are the single worst implemented policy in modern cities. Because at some point, the green belt has to end. And that's where people stop driving and start building their housing. Construction complete. That's why you'll read article after article about sprawl in cities that theoretically shouldn't have sprawl. The sprawl is occurring at record levels just on the other side of a green belt. So it's even worse than before. It's sprawl plus 30 extra minutes of driving in a car because it's now too far away to have good rapid transit to the door. Some land held in reserve as wetlands or special crop growing zones, which is fine, but most of the time we are just saving one farm closer to the city to build on another farm further away. More expensive, less transit friendly, longer commutes, etc. The green belt really is a great metaphor. I mean, a belt never stopped someone from getting fat. So we have a green belt muffin top going on. So here is Toronto, here is the green belt, and oh look at this. Look at all this new housing getting built. Here is Ottawa, and here is the green belt, but over here in the west, and over here in the east, massive new detached single family housing developments. Suburbs to the left, sprawl on the right, and stuck in the middle is you, paying extremely high housing prices because that densification has not happened anywhere near fast enough. We didn't follow up the green belt with a mechanism that would build that promised density. Instead of building a little bit of density everywhere across the existing sprawl, which would be awesome, every local neighborhood fought densification. It was only squeezed in where the opposition wasn't strong enough. I bet that your city has a spot like Griffintown in Montreal, where a bunch of low density, mostly industrial land with very few voters to stop it was used to provide relief for the housing market. Thousands of high density units were thrown in because it was just one of the few places that we could actually do what we need to do as a city and provide a place for people to live. Of course, people love to gripe about these sorts of places. Oh, it's very artificial. It's not very organic, but it's like, well, this is the only thing we could build because of our stupid policies. It's a common form of intense high density, growing like weeds through the politically possible cracks that we have left. But that land has mostly run out in greenbelt cities, and so now they are almost always notoriously expensive. On the other hand, the large cities that don't have them are often case studies for low-cost housing. I had this realization that green belts were a problem when I saw this cabin in a car park style of housing that's really popular on the edge of many Canadian cities. It's a style that was popular in the 2000s. You can see it being built in the very first grainy Google Street View photos. Seeing developments frozen in time from just over a decade ago felt like a plumber finding the clog in a pipe. Uh, yeah, there's your problem. You guys cut off your primary source for new housing and you didn't set up a new one. This was also when I realized that urbanists got played by green belts. Have you ever noticed how green belts, a measure to prevent suburban sprawl, have been quite popular? Perhaps 
too popular. The reason that green belts were enacted in so many cities was because the first phase of a plan, make a green belt, is politically feasible. Would you like to live on the edge of a picturesque field for the rest of your life? Yes! Okay, great. So that's done. That's phase one. Now for phase two, we're gonna need to densify your neighborhood a little bit. You know, throw up some multifamily, some medium density, just like every couple of years to, to keep the supply high. No! Oh, you don't wanna do that? No! Oh, okay, so, hmm. Now that means that your house price is gonna go up, right? Because there's less supply. Woo! And let me guess, now that your backyard is the green belt, you're suddenly an environmentalist and you're not going to let anything get built in it. No. Well played, suburban voters. One more win for the suburbs. Is he dead now? I have a pretty surefire test. Call it. Time of death, 318. Well, hey there, city people. It's time to reform this. Here's a plan that can actually work. Green belts are about getting single family sprawl under control, and it was certainly worth a try. Not everything about them was bad, and I think they provided an amazing opportunity. Transit-oriented development comes up a lot these days. This is typically where you find or build transit lines and plan higher density developments around them that are pedestrian friendly and also make use of a transit, hence the name. But what I think we need is more of this specifically, transit first development. 150 years ago, this was a field far away from the center of the rapidly growing city of Montreal on the other side of a failed volcano. Loser! A bunch of railway executives realized that they could dig a tunnel under the mountain, run a railway line out to this land, and set up shop, build a town, funding the railway line with the town that they built. It was some real SimCity shit. <laughs> the reason that existing cities were sprawling and that green belts were even implemented is because existing owners didn't want medium density popping up throughout their neighborhood. That political reality hasn't changed, but the green belts have given us an opportunity to fence in poorly planned suburban sprawl with the right sort of residential. Greenway parks that provide active transportation routes for pedestrians and cyclists, rapid transit solutions built right into the neighborhood from the beginning. All of this can be built and paid for by selling people the housing that our city so desperately need. Which is exactly what they did here a hundred years ago. To this day, what they did is brilliant. It looks lovely, it's cash positive, it's always been a desirable place to live. It's the sort of environment and form of housing that just works for humans. Building into greenfields was and is politically feasible, much more so than sprinkling in medium density down existing streets. By encircling existing sprawl with medium density, we change the mix of voters, so transit users start living in places that everyone once drove. We are seeding a change of lifestyle out to the edges of our city. And then from there, we can work our way from both the urban core and the outer fringes inwards. There is a big picture benefit to all of this. If residents of cities with green belts truly care about the environment, they'll realize that our failure to address housing supply issues simply shifted our sprawl elsewhere. Sure, a lot of it just moved 30 minutes further out, but big picture, it often is a more catastrophic failure. People are packing up and flying to green belt free, car infested sprawl, the worst possible outcome. So many environmentally friendly cities have made it economically irrational for people to live there. So they have been moving to cities like Houston, where they have a much bigger environmental footprint, but hey, that city builds enough houses for the people who move there, while our green belt cities are out of sight, out of mind, environmentalists. Smugly gazing over a wall of farms and effectively driving people away to places where they are worse for the environment. Everyone has their breaking point. Do you want to work one less day a week to live in a bedroom suburb? What about two less days a week? A 30 year mortgage or a 10 year mortgage? That's what we're up against. That's what happens when cities have housing that is a third of the price with similar salaries. We are living in societies that literally wave a million dollars and an early retirement in someone's face and then asks them to make the right choice for the environment. It's time to stop being so naive about the consequences of our action at the local level. They have a global impact. We've realized in the last couple of decades the power of medium density, a revelation that has become increasingly mainstream since green belts were introduced. Setting aside this land has created a politically viable space in the sprawl sandwich 
to solve a lot of these problems at once, both inspiring and making our cities less suburban. And in that process, adding new supply to bring down housing prices that would help reduce sprawl all over the country. The initial green belts were implemented as a way to prevent growing outwards and start growing upwards. But facing the world as it is and adjusting your plans based on what's actually working is probably the part of growing up that we actually need to do now. As cities expanded, transporting people around them in a private car became harder to manage. Any two microphone owning lispy Canadian couple will tell you that. Hope your bike gets stolen. Again. We've realized in the last couple of decades the power of transit-oriented, medium-density, bike and pedestrian-friendly development. Man, it's such a fucking clumsy way of saying it. But facing the world as it is and adjusting your plans based on what works or not so that you can achieve your goals is the sort of growing up that we actually need to do now. Grow up, hippies. I hope you get grease on your disc brakes. <laughs>